This is what I wanted to show you about FlashPine. And now we are getting a little bit more into a generic product, uh, fuel testing by um, infrared analysis. First, I want to show you how this infrared analysis uh, works and, and uh, what it does in fuel analysis, uh, how it's uh, working with our IR vision and uh, what test methods we have and what they are. So if you look into fuel speed, the diesel fuel, jet fuel or gasoline, you have really a complex mixture, mixture of different hydrocarbons. In spectroscopy, those components uh, which you have there absorb a characteristic part of the radiation and thus can be detected. Among the many parameters, uh, there are concentrations, components, which you see here, and uh, components are typically oxygenates, ethers, uh, aromatics, octane boosters, and uh, other things. And then you have uh, things that we call properties. Properties because uh, they are not concentrations and not directly measured uh, by infrared, but indirectly through uh, correlation databases. Um, with the exception of the density, we have a built-in density meter, but octane number, C10 number, vapor pressure, distillation point, flash point, even freezing point, those are all correlated uh, properties which you can train into the instrument. And these many parameters are allowing you to characterize a fuel uh, very good, and that's uh, uh, why it's uh, widely used. It's uh, relevant for everybody who deals with fuels, starting from the producers, uh, like the refineries, biofuel producers, the blenders, transportation and storage operators, uh, terminals, uh, then, of course, the fuel outlets, uh, gas stations, and all the consumers, be it simple uh, car drivers, car manufacturers, or uh, customers who buy bulk fuels like mining uh, operators, the military, uh, and so on. But also in QC laboratories and R&D laboratories, you see this uh, analyzer very often. So how is infrared spectroscopy working? And there are basically four techniques which you can apply to disperse the radiation or the energy to see which characteristic energy was absorbed by the components which I've mentioned before. And each technique has uh, unique advantages and limitations. Uh, the first and most simple technique are uh, prisms. It's also the most cheapest ways, filters and prisms. The prisms only work around the visible range, but the filters are uh, widely applicable from uh, X-ray radiation up to uh, very long wavelengths, uh, infrared, far infrared, for example. Then you have uh, grating mirrors. Grating mirrors are specially designed mirrors that, uh, depending on the angle of reflection, are reflecting uh, different uh, energy bands of the radiation. They are also uh, quite flexible and uh, applicable over a wide range, but uh, tend a little bit to glitches at certain uh, wavelengths. Then uh, very modern are quantum cascade lasers. Uh, the quantum cascade lasers uh, have the advantage of high intensity. So if you just uh, uh, need very high intensity and uh, need to use, show it, uh, look at the limited uh, narrow energy band, then they are ideal. So the limitation is really that they have a very limited uh, energy band you can use. The most flexible and widely applied uh, technique is basically the Fourier transformation infrared spectroscopy because it's very flexible. It applies an interferometer like is shown here and I will show you a little bit on the next slides. And the interferogram is then transformed uh, to an absorption spectra by the mean of a Fourier transformation. So this is basically the setup of uh, the Michelson interferometer in the FTR system that we are using. Basically, you have a light source, uh, incoming radiation, then a beam splitter. This is the heart, basically, of the interferometer because it uh, uh, reflects one part of the light to a scanning mirror, which is moving back and forth, and the other part is going to a so-called fixed mirror. 
both radiations, when they come back, they combine. And depending on the phase shift that you, which you have uh, introduced through the scanning mirror, um, you are uh, getting here a different uh, intensity of the radiation. And out of this intensity, the sample here is uh, also absorbing their particular portions. And then you have a, a detector who is detecting the intensity. And basically the intensity is plotted versus the distance that scanning mirror is driving. And what you get is basically an interferogram. So the setup of our instrument is uh, basically using three different cells. You see here the 100 micron cell and here a 35 micron cell. In uh, the first run, we are doing uh, basically just a scan of the window. This is just a window to get a reference scan. And in the standard uh, measurements, we are scanning uh, through the 35 micrometer sample width. This is applicable for most uh, uh, fuels and samples. But uh, for certain standards, we also need to use, especially for jet or diesel standards, the 100 micron cell. What you finally get after you transform your um, interferogram is an absorption spectrum, which can look uh, like this uh, on the screen of uh, the uh, instrument itself. Or we have also a specially designed software where you can also work with the spectra. Uh, this is a representation of several spectra overlaid to each other. The range which we are using is really covering uh, the typical range of the mid infrared uh, uh, spectrum. We have a resolution of 3.8 centimeters, which is uh, the ideal resolution, uh, resolution, especially also for doing uh, property predictions. The spectrum can be exported, uh, also to be used in other uh, spectroscopic programs. And it's also possible to connect uh, to this uh, directly through an FTP access and download the spectrum. We have customers who are doing this. Now we have uh, the spectrum, but how can you now uh, get to the corresponding parameters? To get to the parameters, uh, which I've mentioned before, the concentrations or octane ratings and so on, uh, we apply five different types of methods in the IR vision. And we differentiate direct methods, K-matrix, arithmetic methods, then the chemometrics, partially squares, or the cluster analysis or nearest neighbor search which I would uh, rather call this. And the uh, corresponding parameters are pure components for the direct or the K-matrix. For the arithmetic, arithmetic means that it takes uh, results and basically combines them arithmetically. And uh, for the PLS, for the chemometrics, uh, the property predictions are basically coming out. Direct method. How does it look like? Basically, the direct method is uh, calibrating the height of a peak or the area of a peak to a certain concentration of a component. That's very simple and, and typically the state uh, of the art uh, or the, the classical domain of spectroscopy. But as mentioned, fuels are complex mixtures and these direct methods work only if you have not overlapping peaks or um, very isolated peaks like in diesel or jet fuel, those are more featureless. But gasoline, for example, has a very um, broad mixture of different components, oxygenates. And here we are using the uh, K matrix. The K matrix, for example, is using uh, uh, the individual spectra of uh, the components, like they are shown here, as uh, a calibration part. And this is then uh, with a certain matrix operation uh, tried to fit into the actual measured spectrum. And uh, if you are fitting this into the sample spectrum, the fit parameters are proportional to the concentration of these individual components. So you can again get the concentrations, but even though you have uh, a lot of overlapping peaks. So that's uh, the good advantage of the K matrix method. Chemometrics, the partially squares, is applying a model, and the model needs to be trained into the instrument. So, how does this uh, training work in a very simplistic way? 
I just wanted to highlight you this, this little peak here, which could be one of uh, the many features which we could track. And uh, we have the spectrum of a typical gasoline. So now if we are applying uh, the, this uh, spectrometer and we plot this peak height here against the uh, property which we want to measure, then uh, we can measure different gasolines and we need to measure different gasolines where especially this feature, this peak is changing its height. And uh, we see that this uh, peak is changing the height with, uh, with uh, raising octane rating. I mean, it's a very simplistic way, of course, but it shows the principle of this PLS. And then we, you can fit basically a PLS model into this. So it's basically a regression analysis. What can you do with this regression analysis? Now, if you have an unknown sample, you can look at this peak height and then you take the model and you can basically take out uh, the octane rating as a result based on this model. What's the nearest neighbor search or cluster analysis? This is a little bit dangerous, but we added it because uh, many customers requested it uh, and uh, our, uh, our competitors also use this. But uh, it's, it's something where you have to be a little bit cautious because what it's doing, it's basically not taking the model as a result, but it takes uh, the nearest uh, other sample, which is in a database, which it finds, and then reports uh, the value of this particular sample, it's finding, which is very similar to the one which you have measured in the ideal case. The cluster analysis or nearest neighbor search has, of course, some advantages if it's very difficult to establish a PLS model, like you see here, uh, when you have very heterogeneous uh, sample composition views from, from uh, which are just not, not uh, allowing you to uh, make a good tight model, then uh, the cluster analysis can be a little bit more of advantage. The cluster analysis is designed that, for example, if you have uh, in a vicinity of a certain uh, result two or more fitting that it takes the average as a result as shown here. So this is showing you the five different methods uh, that are used uh, by our instruments. Um, the graphical user interface of uh, the IR vision is a little bit different. It's uh, not on this uh, same standard as it was with the vapor pressure and the flash point, but it's uh, still very intuitive. You have the main screen, of course, when you want to do a measurement, you click on the measurement. Here you can uh, set the different uh, parameters, but basically what you need to do is press the start button and provide the sample. And uh, afterwards you will get uh, the results. The results has a header section where you have, for example, the um, typical features of the um, sample like the density as well and some other parameters that have been chosen and then a list of uh, the results which are given here. These yellow bars which you see also overlaying uh, some of the results are giving you the typical range so it gives you a good indication if uh, you are out of a range or within the, the typical range and, and you can of course flexibly set this. So this is uh, also the summary of the IR vision. It comes in three different flavors. Basically, we uh, have a, one dedicated to gasoline, one dedicated to diesel, and then uh, also a pro version, which uh, uh, combines the diesel and the, the gasoline and also adds the jet fuel parameters. Um, from the hardware, both instruments or all three instruments are the same. It's basically the calibration and the software which makes a little bit of difference here. I have mentioned this uh, two plus one cell design, which is laser regulated, self-aligning mirrors. That's basically also something which is a quite unique uh, feature. Uh, this FTIR Mikkelsen interferometer is, is, uh, needs to be very well aligned to get the optimal uh, result. And that's uh, what the self-aligning mirrors are doing. And uh, with the latest version, we also optimize the signal to noise ratio by having a good heat source, uh, a cool controlled uh, um, 
detector and uh, special electronics to optimize the signal to noise ratio. There are international standards and practices. Uh, this is for oxygenates, for benzene. That's basically the density meter standard, which is in there. This is for biodiesel, then uh, corresponding uh, EN standards. And then, of course, a wide range uh, of uh, standards we are correlating to. Correlation means uh, these properties which we are predicting. Uh, and uh, to create the database or prediction property, basically uh, you are taking the results of the original standards, like here the NOC engine, and then you feed this information along with the spectrum into the instrument. And here are many more standards to which we can correlate because uh, of the flexibility of this system, of this instrument. As, as long as the composition has something to do with the property, you may find features in the spectrum that you can correlate. So uh, this database of fuels and the uh, number of parameters which we can provide with the instrument is constantly growing. So finally, uh, integration and automation with uh, the cockpit. Cockpit is basically the window software which uh, is combining all the uh, vision instruments of Gradner instruments. You can use it to consolidate the results from multiple locations in one central lab. You can uh, deploy different uh, standard operating procedures, user roles, and uh, just from a single place and make sure that every laboratory you are working with who has the same instrument is using exactly the same methods and the naming convention, user roles conventions, and so on. You can also check the calibration and calibration history of every instrument. Uh, you can uh, configure and uh, provide support to the minimum minima VP vision and also the FP vision, which I didn't mention here. And uh, I've mentioned also um, SQC and GLP compliance according to D6299. 